How does consciousness occur? This question is considered by some to be the greatest mystery in science and philosophy. A simple way to approach the problem is to look at what it is to be conscious. Being conscious can be described to have the following three features. Level, that you are in a conscious state and not unconscious, for example you are awake and not asleep. Content, that when you are conscious, you are conscious of something, for example you are conscious that you are watching a YouTube video right now and self, the specific experience of being you. However, how do we even know if others have a conscious mind like us and that they are simply not biologically programmed to react in the way that they do, like how Siri on an iPhone is programmed to react in a specific way to different phrases? Is it possible that everyone else is a philosophical zombie, that they react and respond like a normal human being but they do not actually have thoughts and feelings? How do we disprove this? What makes it so intriguing is how we struggle to explain something that we all experience. The philosopher David Chalmers categorised this puzzle into two problems. The first is the easy problem, which is addressing how the brain works through biological mechanisms, and the second is the hard problem, which is proving that the biological mechanisms you have identified from the first problem have anything to do with consciousness. The easy problem can be observed and measured, and we will probably solve it one day. It is the hard problem, linking consciousness to this mixture of mechanisms, that is much more challenging. Nonetheless, the neuroscientist Anil Seth discusses a third category, the real problem, which is trying to describe the various characteristics of consciousness in terms of its biological properties. This route may yield better results, however even this is difficult. For example, we know that the production of consciousness may not have anything to do with the following, the number of neurons, as the cerebellum has more neurons than the rest of the brain but damage to the cerebellum does not cause a loss in consciousness. Any particular region of the brain, although different regions have been identified for consciousness, they are more like on-off switches rather than generators of consciousness, or simple neural activity, as the brain is highly active even during an unconscious state. Despite this, researchers recently have found some links between biological features and consciousness. One study found that the connections between the pontine tegmentum to the anterior insula and anterior cingulate cortex were essential for consciousness. Another group of researchers found that stimulating a nerve in the brain called the vagal nerve restored consciousness in a man that was in a vegetative state for 15 years. This is exciting as both studies imply a possibility to answer the real problem. What seems to be the case for consciousness is that it is about how different regions in the brain talk to each other in response to sensory inputs. A possible approach to look into this would be to accurately measure consciousness, fully understand human perceptual and motor behaviour, and create a gold standard in methods to study the brain. The first step is to measure consciousness. Scientists currently use something called the Perturbational Complexity Index to measure consciousness using a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Through further research in this area, the idea is to quantify consciousness, making it more physical and thus easier to observe. The second step would be to establish how our brain converts all the sensory inputs it receives into our perception of things. There is a theory called the Bayesian Brain Theory and it states that what we see and feel is based basically our brain making a prediction of what it thinks all the information it is receiving from our body means. This prediction is based on past experience and knowledge. For example, have a look at this image. If it is your first time looking at it, you will probably just see blobs of black and white. Your brain has not seen this image before, so doesn't know what to make of it. Now look at this image, and now again at the previous image. Now you no longer see blobs of black and white, but an actual image. Your brain is making a prediction of what this image is based on the past experience of seeing a coloured image of a horse and a woman. However, we don't know how true this theory is. So by doing further research into the different theories that try to explain perception, we may strengthen our grasp on consciousness. The third step would be to improve our monitoring of the brain. Right now, a lot of what we are learning of the human brain is based on what we can observe in the brain of rodents. But how can something as complicated as consciousness be successfully understood by looking at a mouse's brain? Unless we significantly improve the methods by which we study the brain, we may never be able to decode the ways different regions of the brain communicate with each other in consciousness. Perhaps the Allen Institute for Brain Science would be able to provide the solution for this. They have created a database of actual live human brain cells consisting of 300 living neurons with computer models that mimic their electrical properties. 
However, it is uncertain if these three steps will bring us closer to understanding consciousness. What is certain is that if we do find the answer, the implications are limitless. It will significantly advance the fields of artificial intelligence, medicine, psychology, philosophy and neuroscience. What makes the problem so thought-provoking and perplexing at the same time is whether there is even an answer out there. As scientists, how are we supposed to research and truly understand the human body if we cannot understand the very thing that pilots it, the human mind? If you have found this video interesting, please subscribe to the channel and check out the other videos.